Good afternoon. I'm Cheryl Warner in NASA's Office of Communications. Thank you for joining us today to discuss SpaceX's ninth commercial resupply services mission to the International Space Station. A Dragon spacecraft is set to deliver nearly 5,000 pounds of science, crew supplies, and hardware to the orbiting laboratory. The spacecraft is scheduled to lift off on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket at 12.45 a.m. Eastern on Monday, July 18th from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Here to discuss the mission are Joel Monteblano, Deputy ISS Program Manager for Utilization, NASA's Johnson Space Center. Hans Koenigsman, Vice President of Flight Reliability, SpaceX. Julie Robinson, Chief ISS Program Scientist, NASA's Johnson Space Center. Captain Laura Godoy, Launch Weather Officer, 45th Weather Squadron. And Cody Chambers, Range Safety, Kennedy Space Center. Each speaker will deliver brief remarks. Please hold your questions until the end. Anyone on the phone line can press star one at any time to ask a question. To submit a question online, please use the hashtag AskNASA. Joel, we're excited about the cargo headed to the space station, especially the international docking adapter. What can you tell us about both? So, well, first of all, good afternoon and uh, welcome back to uh, Kennedy Space Center. It's great to be here for another commercial resupply service mission. You know, we're looking forward to this mission. It's bringing critical supplies, critical hardware, like you mentioned, the International Docking Adapter to the International Space Station. We got a busy week ahead of us. So uh, just uh, later this afternoon, we'll have a progress launch from uh, Baikonur, Kazakhstan. They're scheduled to launch at uh, 5.40 uh, Kennedy Space Center time. They'll go ahead and dock Monday evening around 8.30 Kennedy Space Center time. We'll have uh, this launch uh, just uh, about 15 minutes prior to 1 a.m. Monday morning and then the, the berthing on the Wednesday morning, Kennedy Space Center time. So, and this just adds to the, the busy time we've been having. About a week and a half ago, we had a Soyuz launch from Baikonur, Kazakhstan. Three new crew members were added to the International Space Station. The crew has wasted no time getting acclimated and, and they're running and going. I mean, they are doing, picking up the science program uh, that we've been working so hard to maintain for, for everyone. Uh, they just been picking up with, without a beat. So we're glad to see those guys are there. Um, as far as uh, this mission, you know, the, uh, the again, an, another mission coming to the International Space Station, the, uh, the commercial resupply services uh, for both SpaceX and, and the orbital team have been just doing a fantastic job for us. So we're happy to uh, be a big part of this mission, and uh, we're looking forward to the launch. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. And now we're here from Hans with an update from SpaceX. Right, good afternoon. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, this is the... Uh, our second Dragon mission for this year. And, um, and as always, I'd like to thank NASA for the opportunity to supply the uh, space station. And in, in this case in particular, I also want to like um, to thank the FAA and the 45th Space Wing um, Safety Organization <coughs> because we had uh, a lot of work over the last couple of weeks um, to prepare for the, uh, for the land landing that we're going to perform uh, this time. Uh, I'm just coming from the static fire. We uh, static fired earlier today at, uh, I think it was 8.30. Um, we had uh, operations going through the night. Um, everything looks very good right now. Uh, we're gonna have a data review um, later today and, uh, and that's gonna, gonna be a launch readiness review at the same time. So I don't expect anything uh, at this time other than a go for um, Sunday to Monday night. Uh, the launch time is uh, 45 minutes after midnight, 45 minutes and 23 seconds, I think, uh, currently. Um, we have a backup opportunity on, um, I think it is Tuesday night to Wednesday on the 20th. Um, and, uh, and that actually currently is uh, 17 seconds after midnight, so it might shift left to right a little bit and actually uh, jump the day, which uh, would be pretty funny. Um, this one also is interesting for us because we have um, obviously Monday here in, in Florida and uh, still Sunday back in, in California. And so I will see this uh, book kept on the two different dates in the future here. Um, so seventh mission for this year, uh, basically, and uh, we've been ramping up the missions over um, the last couple of months following um, our um, you know, investigation uh, I'm, I'm also really excited about IDA and, uh, and now how critical this is for NASA and, uh, and the, the, the ISS in general. 
Um, and also, of course, for SpaceX um, going forward with Glue Dragon. So this is a really, um, a really important piece of hardware. It's an external piece of um, an external uh, payload, which is in the trunk of Dragon and needs to be uh, pulled out with the um, station um, ro uh, robotic arm. Uh, so regarding land landing, um, you will you will see the first stage burn for about two minutes and twenty seconds, two and a half minutes roughly, and uh, when it shuts down and uh, deploys the uh, second stage, uh, you, you'll see probably if the weather is good, of course. Um, actually, you don't see it because it's dark. But <laughs> if you if you if it would be in daylight, you would see the stage turning around and uh, and doing a boost back burn. Um, that burn is pretty long. It's a forty second. Uh, 50 second uh, boost back burn on the first stage, um, followed by a, uh, an entry burn about um, six and a half minutes um, uh, after liftoff. And then that is followed by a landing burn right around eight minutes. Um, the landing uh, is gonna occur at landing zone one, which is the old uh, slick 13 or 12, I forgot exactly which one it is. I think it's 12, um, down in the, uh, in, at South, south of the uh, in Cape Canaveral, a um, couple of miles away from the from the uh, the launch site. Uh, second stage continues for another six and a half minutes. Um, it will deploy the nose cone after about forty seconds to a minute, um, and then Dragon will be deployed uh, about thirty seconds after shutdown, and will be on its way to the station over the next couple uh, two days actually, and um, and then be birthed by the uh, robotic arm again. Um, that's all I have right now. I'm really excited again and, uh, and uh, looking forward to this mission. Thank you, Hans. We're really excited and looking forward to this mission as well. Now, Julie, what can you tell us about the trailblazing science that we're sending to the International Space Station? Well, Dragon is a really important vehicle uh, for science because of its capabilities in launching live samples and also for its return capability. So we have about 930 kilograms of uh, research samples going up and about uh, 580 kilograms of samples coming back home. One of the things that I really notice across all the cargo on this flight, and, and it's supporting literally hundreds of investigations that are going on in the space station right now, one of the things I notice is a number of studies that are looking at genetic, gene expression, uh, proteomics, and all of these uh, molecular approaches to understanding life that are so important back here on Earth in personalized medicine. Those are also being studied in space, and it's interesting the kinds of samples that are included, things like heart cells, muscle cells, uh, bone cells, uh, a mouse study looking at epigenetics, which is being done for our Japanese colleagues, plant seedlings, all of those are, are going to be studied in terms of their gene expression and, and how being in space really affects those organisms. Also, there are really interesting applied physical sciences, such as studies of hard to wet surfaces being done by Eli Lilly, uh, studies of copper tin and copper silver alloys uh, being done in collaboration with our European colleagues, studies of phase change heat exchange and a new facility that will let us continue to do new studies of how to better do thermal control in space. And, one, and another interesting thing that's going up is an instrument to help in managing maritime traffic back here on Earth. We'll have a briefing tomorrow with some of these scientists to tell you about some of their work. But from an overall perspective, this is just part of the rich stream of research going on in the space station, from human research, biology, physical science investigations, and things for exploration technology. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. It's pretty incredible what we're able to accomplish up there. Now, Laura, how is the weather looking for this launch? It's looking pretty good, Cheryl. First, let's take a look at this satellite imagery. You can see the high pressure center over the Atlantic Ocean has a ridge axis extending into central Florida. This ridge axis is causing southeasterly wind flow today and is expected to push north over northern Florida tomorrow, which will cause more easterly flow Sunday night into early next week. You can also see the sea breeze, uh, the East Coast sea breeze progressing inland, as well as triggering, triggering afternoon thunderstorms. And with the onshore flow being stronger tomorrow, we're expecting those afternoon to evening thunderstorms to progress west of the spaceport. And on Sunday, over the mid and upper levels, we're expecting high pressure to build over the central United States. 
With the building high pressure center, we're expecting relatively light winds aloft out of the northeast. And again, with that northeasterly flow, it'll keep all uh, convective activity well west of Florida's east coast. As we take a look at the launch forecast, you can see that we are going for just few to scattered skies and no significant restrictions to visibility. The winds will be light out of the southeast and the winds will be off the ocean, which will cause the overnight temperatures to remain in the lower 80s. Because the launch time is just prior to 1 a.m., we're expecting the majority of the daytime and evening thunderstorms to have dissipated over uh, central and western Florida. And the cumulus clouds and uh, overnight showers that we typically see in the easterly flow regime uh, will not really develop until after 4 a.m., extending into uh, just prior to uh, noon on Monday. Therefore, the probability of violation will be low for, at uh, launch time at 10 percent, and this would just be due to the cumulus cloud rule and the dragon capsule's flight through pre precipitation rule. Since the conditions are not changing uh, for the first stage flyback and landing, we have no additional weather concerns. Um, regarding uh, violations. In the event of a delay, so a launch Tuesday around midnight into Wednesday morning, we expect similar weather conditions as a first attempt. The only real change in the weather pattern is the potential for a tropical easterly wave to progress through the pattern. And these easterly waves may enhance the nocturnal uh, cumulus clouds and showers, as well as increase the cloud coverage over the area. Therefore, the thick cloud rule has been added as a primary weather concern, and the probability of violation increases to 30% for Tuesday night. So overall, we expect um, just few to maybe scattered clouds for the launch time with um, a full moon out as well. So if you're able to, I hope you're uh, going to come out and watch the launch. That's all I got, Cheryl. Thank you, Laura. Now we, have, now we will hear from our final speaker, Cody, with an update on the range. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're targeting launch of the ninth SpaceX commercial resupply mission for NASA to the International Space Station for 12.45 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That's local. In advance to the launch, the 45th Space Wing provided KSC with a risk analysis um, that was provided to us yesterday. Uh, we determined we are go for launch. There are a number of safety assessments performed by the wing and evaluated by NASA <clears throat> before each mission. Uh, NASA range safety engineers here at KSC accepted the current risk assessment, which required taking some mitigating actions for debris and toxic dispersion risks. These actions included clearing a number of NASA facilities here at KSC within the hazard launch area, hazardous launch area. Uh, the Brevard County community outside of KSC was not affected, however. Any facility within the launch hazard area, this includes the press site, will need, be needed cleared at 60 minutes prior to the launch time. The dispersion risk uh, for this launch is driven predominantly by the onshore winds present this time of year. The analysis is performed based on the forecasted weather data and will be refined as we move closer to the launch time. Um, following this assessment, we'll continue to work closely with the wing to refine and fully understand the um, toxic dispersion modeling present and uh, we'll work toward making sure everybody has an exciting and wonderful view of the skies tomorrow night. Joe? Thank you, Cody. We'll now move into our question and answer session. We will begin with questions in the room, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. We will take questions after that from the phone line. Again, to enter the queue, please press star one at any time. And to ask questions online, please use the hashtag AskNASA. We'll begin with Bill in the back. Hi, uh, Bill Harwood with CBS News. For, for Cody, can you go into a little more detail about, uh, uh, this is obviously, I guess, for SpaceX Dragon abort scenarios and, and the toxics that are on board the Dragon capsule if there was an abort. Would you just talk about that and, and what could get released? Or maybe that's a Heinz question, I don't know, but um, just go, so, go through the analysis for me. So Thanks. I can speak to the analysis provided to NASA by the 45th Space Wing. Uh, what we're looking at is in the event of a dragon abort scenario, the predominant winds would carry the spacecraft back toward KSC property. Um, the, the spacecraft on impacting the ground could see a risk of releasing its toxic commodities. As such, we need to take actions to ensure that 
our people, the viewing public, as well as, as visiting uh, guests are kept safe. So we thought it prudent to move um, visitors outside the areas of highest risk due to the winds. And um, I'm not sure if we could speak to the, the actual commodities on board of the SpaceX Dragon capsule. But that question, what are the commodities we're talking about? I mean, I think I know what they are, but I'd like for you to explain it. But what, what's going to be different on a manned, a piloted version of the Dragon? Because obviously you're not going to have people on board if there's any chance of a risk of letting consumables like this get loose. So maybe the difference between cargo ship, manned ship in this context. Thanks. So on Dragon, nothing is different from the last slide. I'd like to point that out. We, <coughs> we have Hypergol um, propellants on board, and um, uh, they are, those are, those are um, toxic. So um, I, I understand the precaution on the ranger side. The wind is in an unfavorable direction, but on the Dragon side, um, nothing changed um, over, over the uh, last couple of years in, in terms of design or anything in terms of uh, risk to, to the public here any, um, from the design perspective. Uh, in terms of uh, Crew Dragon, totally different situation. Crew Dragon has an integrated board system, so um, it's going to be, in, in case of, of any um, mishap, uh, the capsule would basically save itself and the astronauts, and, um, and it would not get into the situation where you would impact the ground, um, potentially. It would rather land um, safely on the ground after you know, pulling out and, and going to a safe distance. It's, it's a very different situation uh, to this Cargo Dragon. But um, I, I actually think all these um, precautions and risks are, are really, um, I really appreciate the, the, the range um, working with us in particular, not just on, on the Dragon side, but also on the, um, the landing side. Um, we, had, uh, we had a really uh, fruitful cooperation with range safety, uh, the 45th Space Wing here, <coughs> to, to, to enable the land landing and uh, make sure that we do this in a safe way without any risk to the public. Great. Next question from Irene. Hi. Thank you. Uh, Irene Klotz with Reuters. Um, Hans, just to be clear, the changes that were made uh, to have a, uh, to be able to recover Dragon in case of an accident, that would be for a parachute landing at sea. And this whole scenario driving the evacuation of the press site is in case that system didn't work and it landed on land? No, I don't think these are related. I think the, um, I, what you're referring to is um, one of the changes we implemented after um, the mishap um, where we could basically have saved Dragon by deploying the parachutes. Um, and that's, uh, we, we've, we've implemented that, that particular change uh, from now on. But you need to get to a certain altitude in order to pull the, uh, the parachutes out. Um, and there's an initial phase early on where you might not be able to, to do this. So it's going to be enabled um, later on. I don't think it's, it, it is related to that particular scenario. And um, for Joel, um, does the progress need to be docked um, before SpaceX is clear to launch? No. So what we'll do is if uh, progress, progress is going to launch and dock, and then SpaceX will loiter if, if progress had an issue. But right now, progress is, you know, there's progress is going to be docked Monday night. And so there's uh, no constraint to SpaceX launch due to the progress docking. Thanks. And how long could SpaceX loiter? Uh, I don't have, do you, do you have the, uh, the number of days? I don't, it's probably driven more by your <coughs> payload than yeah. by our spacecraft. We could, yeah. we could later for, uh, loiter for a couple of days, but yeah. I think there's a payload um, time limit yeah. on board. Irene, we, we can follow up with you afterward. Okay. Great. Next question y in the yellow, please. Um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press for Hans. Oh. Hans here. Yeah. Here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, I'm wondering, w w do you have a target date yet for your first um, recycled rocket launch? Um, and what are you doing to the booster to, to, if anything yet, to get it ready to fly? And, and if you could provide a little update, too, on the status of your crew, crew Dragon and how that's going and whether you think you can still make it next year for a launch. Okay. So um, first on the uh, uh, reflight of the recovered booster, um, that's going to be uh, most likely in fall this year, we are um, we are prepping the booster again, um, and we well first of all we gotta wash them right. Um, they come back uh, slightly slightly uh, blackened, um, and uh, and we got to go through a series of tests with the hardware on on the booster itself to make sure 
everything's working, everything's uh, is uh, functioning. You also have a parallel test program running to make sure that um, the booster is qualified for multiple reflights. So that is something that we need to close out before we fly. Um, and then, of course, we need um, to uh, have a customer. We are in talks right now, but we need uh, we haven't finalized those talks um, at this point in time. But m my my guess on this would be it's going to be in, in, in fall um, of this year. Um, second question was on Crew Dragon. Um, I believe we are on track um, right now on the uh, on the demo mission, um, at least on the. On, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with the, the first one. Um, I'm not sure I'm, f I'm too familiar on, on what comes after that. So um, from what I know on the first Dragon mission, we are um, we're doing a lot of work right now. Um, Everything uh, is going, a lot of resources are going into Dragon to, um, to push the uh, crew vehicle and to make sure it's, uh, it's ready to go by, by mid next year. Thank you, and it looks like we have a number of questions. So if you can, please keep your question limit to one at this time. And I believe we're going to go to the phone line for a question. Go ahead with the phone line. All right, James Dean. Oh, thanks. And um, yeah, I'm sorry, I've missed a couple of spots here, so. Forgive me if you've uh, answered this already, but just trying to clarify again if the uh, evacuation of, of certain parts of KSC is related at all to the booster return, or it's, it's exclusively uh, a dragon risk that's been uh, evaluated here. I'm assuming that was directed to me. The, uh, the return of the booster does not introduce any additional risks beyond that we normally see with a return mission to uh, the landing site one with SpaceX. The evacuation and clearing of some of the viewing areas here at KSC is driven by, again, the Dragon abort scenario. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, Hans, could you just discuss uh, your, um, uh, I guess again, you know, your, what you think are the chances of success of uh, a booster landing this time around? And, um, you know, given that, uh, I guess, land is considered a, a, little, a little more favorable than the drone ship, right? And um, now that you have a few under your belt, uh, how, how are you uh, feeling about this next opportunity? Yeah, so uh, I mean, um, the land landing is, um, it doesn't move. <laughs> it's one, one, one advantage and it's actually uh, slightly, uh, it's significantly bigger. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty good, uh, good sized landing pad compared to the, uh, the drone ship and it doesn't have, um, uh, it doesn't have structure left and right that you need to fit the, the vehicle in. So. Um, from that perspective, it, that that's going to be easier. Um, getting back to land is, uh, requires a little bit more propellant, um, or significantly more propellant rather. Um, but um, at the at the end of the day, those trajectories are also um, easier or more benign in terms of heat load and uh, deceleration. So from from that perspective, um, I think it's going to be um, an easier trajectory than the, the last one. Uh, obviously, um, the, these landings are secondary in nature, um, and um, and not not the main mission. Uh, main mission is to to bring cargo to the to the space station. So, um, things uh, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic uh, at this point in time um, mm -hmm. that we we landed. But uh, I would always knock on wood. Um, that's that's by the nature of this this maneuver. It's pretty uh, um, it's pretty challenging. Let's say it this way. And I also want to. Uh, take the chance and go back on the what I said earlier about Dragon. I actually don't know what particular abort scenario drove that analysis. Um, I, I, I don't. I'm not familiar with the analysis. I just want to point that out. Um, that is something that that I haven't seen. I have seen um, some of the numbers, but the details behind those numbers, um, I'm not familiar with. Great. And we'll now go. We will now go back to the room to take questions. Right here. Uh, Ken Kramer, Universe Today in Northeast Astronomy Forum. Um, for, for Hans, I have a question uh, about also the other recovered boosters, the ones to GTO. They landed a little bit hard, two of them, and I don't think you're going to be able to reuse them. And the last one um, didn't land successfully. What, what, are, what are you learning from these hard landings that you might be able to apply? You're going to be changing the structure or any work on the, on the Falcon 9. And... Um, any change in the actual landing scenario, how you do the landing, what, what you've learned? 
from these hard landings. So um, there's, there's certain, the, 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 the primary, there's no structural changes, first of all, you know, and, and in, in general, I think the landing concept with the legs and, uh, and the number of burns and um, the way we, we um, perform those um, seems to work okay. Um, the key thing is to protect the engines and make sure that they start up well. And in particular, the hot um, trajectory, so to speak, or the one that come, come in after a, um, a really fast payload, like the geotrans uh, geotransfer payloads, basically, um, those, those engines need to be protected such that they start up in, in the proper way. And that is something that we learned. Um, we learned a lot by, um, you know, even on the, on the missions when things go wrong, um, like on, on, the, on, you know, on the landing, rather. Everything goes well on the on the main mission, of course. That's actually something that um, always bugs me. We have successful deploy and everything's fine, and uh, and then the, the landing doesn't quite work, and the landing gets all the attention. Yeah, but um, even even on those landings, we learn we learn a lot, and uh, we 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 learned particular on the last um, last landing. Um, we believe we found we found a way to operationally protect these engines and to make it safer for them to start up and to come up to full thrust and uh, stay at full thrust. So um, all, in, all in all, this uh, series of uh, drone ship landings has been, has been uh, extremely successful, even when we didn't recover all the, um, all the first stages. So Actually, we did recover them all. You mean protecting the engines in flight? Is that what you're talking about? Protecting the engines d through during the re-entry. Yeah. That's when it gets hot. And we, we re-enter um, with the engines facing the, the flow. So it's basically the engine directly exposed to the uh, hot flow, and that's when you need to protect the engines and uh, the gases and liquids that are in the engine, uh, make sure that nothing boils off and does funny things. Next question, behind. Uh, Lauren Gresh with Verge. Hans, another question for you. Um, but I know that if you land this one, your hangar is gonna be a little full uh, at 39A, so I'm curious to know about your storage options moving forward. <laughs> It's a good problem to have, right? <laughs> um, I think we're looking at different places to store, and uh, we need to actually, you, you got a good point. We, um, we are working on getting the hangar clear, and, uh, and, uh, and um, we have to start working on, on Falcon Heavy to, to, uh, to get it integrated there. So um, I don't know exactly what, what our options are. I know that the team is working on that, and I, I believe we are looking at different hangars in the, in the vicinity here. Next question from the room, right back here. Hi, Jeff Bounce of Space News. Uh, for Cody, was the timing of the risk assessment driven by the weather forecast because of the winds issue? And has there been, are you aware of previous cases of launches where you've had to ev evacuate uh, KSC facilities like the press site and the VAB because of an issue like this? Uh, well, so the second question first, yes, absolutely. There have been several occasions in the past where we've had to move people um, uh, for one reason or another, be it toxics, distant focused overpressure, or debris. Um, the, to address your first question, we are driven un by uncertainty. And the further out we predict, the more uncertainty there is in the model. So as we get closer and closer to the launch time, we'll get updated analyses run by the wing. Those analyses will then be passed to us in range safety here at KSC. And then we'll evaluate those and make adjustments as necessary. Next question from the room. Hi, so given the loss of the docking adapter last year, um, if there is any sort of catastrophic failure in IDA two or three, is there any sort of contingency plan given that it's likely the Crew Dragon and Boeing Starliner will overlap in their times at the station? So I'll, I'll answer that. The, uh, well, first of all, we have 100% confidence in SpaceX. We're gonna get this guy up there and, and attach the space station as planned. Uh, we do have an, an IDA three that's uh, that's in work as a result you know the the loss the, the first one we've had this in work we got planned that'll fly on a future spacex i believe we're targeting spacex 14 for that um, as far as you know docking mechanisms and we'll just manage what we have uh, there's not a constraint we're going to be ready when the commercial crew program's ready to dock and we'll just manage accordingly sure we'll stay with questions in the room but please remember to identify yourself and who your question is directed to in the very back Stuart Money, Interspace.net, and my question is for Hans. Could you characterize how difficult this particular land landing is 
compared to the Orbcom 2 landing? And what's the availability of propellant margin? Are you confident that the propellant's going to be there? Yeah, it's a good point. Um, the Orbcom uh, 2 landing or Flight 21 um, was very similar, actually. And um, I believe it is on par. Um, I think we, uh, we added um, some improvements over time, as I mentioned earlier, to, to make the, uh, the vehicle more resistant against the recovery. So, so overall, I think um, it, uh, it should have higher chances than that particular land landing, but it's going to be very similar. Um, it's also at night, so you want to see the same, same thing that uh, you saw last time. Um, yeah. For our next question, we'll go to social media. And this is for Hans. Uh, John Kraus asks, how long approximately will each um, entry burn for each stage? I think the entry burns are about um, 15 to 20 seconds. OK. Uh, why each, each stage? It's only one stage that comes back. I'm just reading the okay. question. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, Escape Velocity asks, which experiments going up on SpaceX CRS-9 might help contribute to the commercialization of low Earth orbit? Sure, that's a great question. Um, there are a number of the experiments that are quite applicable to commercialization of low Earth orbit. Certainly, uh, the global automatic identification system, the global AIS, which is an application for commercial maritime traffic. That's a, a space-based capability that's important uh, over the long term. This is a one-year test to, to demonstrate that capability. Uh, the work that Eli Lilly is doing, the work on the metal alloys, all of those different kinds of research linked to different industrial applications back here on Earth. Thank you. I think we'll take a question from the phone line. Mark Gotch, please. Mark Gotch, Historical Aerospace News. Good afternoon, a very informative briefing. Uh, I wanted to direct this to Julie. First off to say, Julie, the science payload going on board is going to be just incredible. Again, once again, going to the greatest laboratory ever created by mankind. And Hans, can you tell me, involving um, the actual Merlin engines, is there any change to those Merlin engines on this mission? And once again, the 45th Space Wing overseeing this mission as they did previously when SpaceX landed on land last December in 2015. They are erring on the side of safety and uh, making sure that everything will be safe, and I commend them, and a good thing they're there. Uh, the truth is, can you tell me also, Hans, the dock adopter ring, what would be its exact weight as a payload on this mission? Thank you. You want to, you want to start that? <laughs> well, um, I certainly agree on the science. And uh, I think there was a question on the Ida, how much that Ida weighed. Ida weighed 500 kilograms. Yeah. I got, I got the question on the M1D. There's no change on that. <laughs> so. All right, we'll take our next question from the room, please. I think please. we got them all. <laughs> Up front, please. Hi, Teddy Cesari with the Utica Phoenix. Um, I was hoping to hear a little bit about the Ida-2 and why it's critical to the commercial crew program. And then on top of that, uh, uh, what kind of impact will the commercial, cr commercial crew program have on the United States aerospace program? So a couple of things. Uh, the commercial crew program, they're, they're going to be docking missions. And uh, right now, the ports that we have on board the International Space Station are berthing missions. So the SpaceX and the orbital missions are berthing the ISS. So these docking ports will enable the commercial crew and enable those missions and, and, and those, uh, those teams, the SpaceX team and, and, and the Boeing team. Um, and I'm sorry, your second question? What kind of impact will... Uh, the, the, oh, commercial the commercial crew impact program, of the commercial yeah. crew. Well, you know, we're we're moving from you know right now, as, as most of you are well aware, we're launching astronauts from the Soyuz vehicles outside of um, from Baikonur, Kazakhstan. With this move to the commercial crew, we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to increase the number of, of USOS crew members to four, and that fourth crew member, all his time is going to be dedicated to research and utilization on board. So right now, 
we tell the teams we average about 35 hours of crew tended utilization of research. That's above and beyond all the autonomous research that's going on. We're going to double that from 35 to almost 70 crew hours once we get the commercial crew program. So that's going to enable us, um, you know, enabling the partners and, and, and bringing that capability back to the United States is, is a huge benefit and, and that'll, be, uh, that'll be seen throughout the aerospace industry. Can we expect to see some of the customers that would usually take a ride on the Soyuz migrating to the U.S. commercial crew program? So uh, right now we're, we're planning to fly professional astronauts on board. And will that be U.S. based specifically or internationally, international astronauts? So it'll be international. So uh, will it be part of our partnership with the, the Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, and the Japanese Space Agency? Yeah. And we'll have, sorry, we have time for one final question right here. Hi, Josh Jenner with the Orbital Dot Space. This question is for Hans. Um, has a booster been chosen specifically for the first reflight test, um, or has that decision been made yet? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> okay. um, it's the CRS-8 booster, the uh, last CRS flight. I think so it landed the, on the was, And that was the first one that landed on the barge? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That will conclude our briefing today. Our next pre-launch briefing will take a deep dive into the science headed to the International Space Station. So please tune in to NASA Television to hear more from Julie and others at 3 p.m. Eastern on Sunday, July 17th. As a reminder, we are targeting launch of SpaceX CRS-9 no earlier than 12.45 a.m. on Monday, July 18th. NASA Television coverage of launch will begin at 11.30 p.m. on Sunday, July 17th. Until then, thank you.